Now Kodak made two series of lenses to suit various retina models. Now one series of lenses was the S series of lenses and they were used on the Retina Reflex S, the Retina 3S, the Retina Reflex 3, the Reflex 4 and the Instamatic Reflex. Here we are concerned with the C-type lenses. Now the C-type series of lenses were used with the Retina 2C, the Retina 3C and the original Retina Reflex camera. These cameras are found fitted with either a Schneider lens or a Rodenstock lens. Now both of these standard lenses are six glass designs and both are convertible types. And what is meant by convertible is that they can be converted to other focal lengths and that's done by changing the front component. The removable lens group here that you see is only half the lens. That front group is removed and it's replaced with one of the alternative front groups for either the wide angle or the telephoto lens. Eastman Kodak only imported the Schneider Xenon equipped cameras into the USA so they are much more common in the States than cameras fitted with the Rodenstock lenses. But the Rodenstock equipped cameras are common enough elsewhere. There are no obvious quality differences between the two marks, though I'm sure that they each have their fans and each of whom will swear on a stack of Bibles that their chosen lens is the superior one. Wide angle and telephoto accessory lenses for these cameras were made by both Schneider and Rodenstock. The lenses from the two different manufacturers were completely incompatible with each other and so if your camera is fitted with a Schneider Xenon standard lens then you need to use the Schneider accessory lenses. And if your camera is fitted with a Rodenstock Heligon standard lens, you will need to use the Rodenstock accessory lenses. The lens mount in the camera shutters and on the lenses themselves are keyed to prevent accidentally fitting the wrong type in each case. The telephoto was an 80mm f4 and there were two 35mm lenses. A 35mm f4 lens of similar size to the 80mm lens and a much smaller 35mm f5.6 lens. Either of the wide angles will suit for use on the rangefinder cameras but if using a retina reflex the 35mm f4 is a much better proposition else the screen image will be too dark to focus correctly. It's important to note that the focus scale ring on the accessory lenses is not actually connected to anything internally and does not focus the lens. The scale is an aid to determining the depth of field and on the later lenses like this particular one here, the scale may also be used to determine the correct setting for the focus helical on the rangefinder camera body. If you're using the lenses on a retina reflex, the focusing should be done simply in the normal way by focusing the image in the finder, as the screen will accurately indicate focus of the image at the film plane. The accessory finder of choice for using with your 2C and 3C cameras is to either to use the sports style frame finder, frame finder C in this case, and it's designed for use with the standard 50mm lens or the 80mm telephoto lens. Now the frame finder C has two sets of frames. When using it with the standard 50mm lens, you would swing the masks up out of the way and you would sight your subject through the normal eye port here and here and that would define the field of view for 50mm lens. For the 80mm lens these frames are swung down into position and looking through the eyesight here and the smaller frame here defines the field of view for your 80mm lens. On the frame finder your parallax correction is made here at the rear sight by sliding the rear sight up or down and aligning the distance mark against this register line here. 
and you don't have to move it much at all. This scale is marked in meters and here I'm moving it from two meters to infinity and you can see that there's very little vertical shift in that case. The optical find is set to use with either the 35mm or 80mm lens by rotating the switch on the top. And what that does is it swings a mask down into play in the 80mm position which restricts the field of view to match that of an 80mm lens. And at the back of the finder here we see the parallax correction dial. Now the parallax correction dial in this case has scales for both meters and feet and this is used, you set this to your focus distance, say for example we set this, I'm looking at the scale in meters and we set that to let's say 4 meters. And basically what this does is it changes the angle of the finder relative to the shoe. So at close distances it angles the finder down and at more distant targets it angles the, the finder more parallel to the lens plane. And that's so that this more accurately reflects the field of view for the lens you have in play at the focus distance you have chosen. S3 lenses with the two big C or three big C, these cameras have flux frames visible in the finder to indicate the field of view for the wide angle, the standard and the telephoto lenses and so no necessary accessory finder is required. On the rangefinder cameras the lens is removed from the mount by simply rotating it anti-clockwise and lifting it out of the mount. On the retina reflex cameras however you need to hold this lock tab inwards and that's pushed towards the centre of the lens held in and then you can rotate the lens and lift it out of the mount. When refitting your standard lens it's most important that you align it correctly. Now there's a small tab on the side of the lens with a red dot on it and that must be lined up with the red dot on the front face of the shutter. And on this reflex camera here, for example, you'd line up your red dots, drop the lens into position. I'm going to hold that button in, but you probably don't need to. And then you lock the lens into place by turning it clockwise. On this 2C camera I have here, it's exactly the same deal. There's this tiny red dot visible on the outer edge of the shutter here. Line up your red dot on that tab with the red dot on the mount, drop the lens into place and rotate it clockwise and it just locks securely into place. Now if you don't get that right, if you put it at one of the other positions it's either not going to fit or if you force it to fit you'll end up with the lens jammed on the camera. And I can tell you from experience that if you manage to jam the lens on the camera it's very likely it's going to need a inexpensive repair to sort things out. One of the reasons for that is that this plate that your lens locks into at this point is located and stopped from turning by a pin that comes up from the mechanism plate inside the shutter. And what happens is if you apply enough force to this ring you will bend that pin damaging the mechanism plate inside the shutter and requiring the whole shutter to be stripped in order to rebuild it on a new mechanism plate. So that's why it's very important to line up the red dots on your lenses to make sure you get the lens in the correct position before you reinstall it on the camera. Now here I have a, um, what's this one, an 80mm f4 lens and its alignment mark, its red dot, is on this sloped surface at the back here. That serves the same purpose as the red dot on the tab on the standard lenses. That must be aligned with the red dot on the camera body. And here we have a 35mm f5.6 lens. And this one has a small red dot on the outer periphery. And on this particular lens I can see that somebody has actually added a large section of red tape at that point to accentuate that that's where the red dot is. 
because it's most important that they go in in the correct spot. Now something that's probably worth telling you here so that you have it clear in your head is that when you have an accessory lens mounted on your retina you will not be able to close the front of the camera. Even with the little 35mm lens on the front there is no way the front of the camera can close. So if you're thinking you're going to set your 35mm lens on there and fold your camera up and stick it in your pocket, I'm afraid you're mistaken. Now here I have an 80mm f4 lens, in this case it's the Schneider lens, the Retina Longar Xenon. And it has two scales, two sets of scales on the scale ring here. Now as I've already said, this isn't connected to anything inside the lens at all. It's simply there as a guide to, so that you can get an impression of what your depth of field will be. And also as a guide to setting the focus scale on the camera. And we'll get into that a bit deeper. But on this lens we have two sets of scales. We have one here marked 50mm and one here marked 80mm. And those are the scales that we'll need to use in normal use of this 80mm lens. Now, on the other side of this ring, there is two more scales. And they are marked 50mm and T1 slash 60. Now the T1 slash 60 is the scale you would use with the T160 lens. The T160 lens is a close-up lens. And that's used with the 80mm lens to allow you to focus closer than you otherwise would be able to. So you have to be cautious to see which of the focus scales you are using with this lens when we go to adjust the focus. And adjusting the focus is slightly cumbersome. But I'll explain that later. And here we have the 35mm f4 lens, and it's similar to the 80mm lens in most ways. But the scale ring only turns half a turn, if that, because it doesn't require the extra scale ring for the close-up lens, because the close-up lens is not something you're normally going to require with the 35mm lens. So we've only got one pair of scale rings on here, and they are marked 50 millimeters on the dark scale and 35 millimeters on the bright scale. And if we were to take one of the small 35 millimeter f5.6 lenses here, they are arranged in the same fashion. They have the pair of focus scales, the 50 and the 35, but they don't have one for a close up lens because it wouldn't be required. Well, I should say something about bubble cases and lens hoods here. Now, bubble cases. Let's see what we've got. Here we have an 80mm f4. This is an older style of lens. It lacks the double scales that the later lenses have. And I'll show you more about that later. But this is a simple bubble case. There's no lens hood with it. The lens is simply bayoneted into the base. And we have the plastic bubble covering it. Our 35mm f5.6 lens is arranged in the same way. No hood with these. And I'll show you what we use for a hood. Here we have a 35mm lens in the common bubble plate case that you see these with. And in this case, this piece is the hood for the 35mm lens. And that forms part of the case. And in use, it's just pushed onto the front of the lens like that. And that's your 35mm hood. As you can see, it's quite a uh, large and cumbersome looking object. But that's what you need for one of these 35mm f4 lenses. Now, the 80mm lens uses a case and hood in much the same way. We can take the top off our bubble case. That just unscrews. 
take our lens out of the case. Now the hood here, there's two pieces. We have the 35mm hood and the 80mm extension that goes with it. And when turned into a, bu a bubble case, the 80mm extension is screwed to the back of the 35mm hood. Clips into its base like that. To make it into a lens hood, we screw the 80mm section onto the front of the 35mm lens. And then that just pushes onto the lens in that fashion. So it's a, a fair old size, that lens hood. But those components both need to be used for an 80mm lens. Now, the 35mm f5.6 lens, what do we do with that? Well, the hood for that is an extension. I'll just pull out this set. I've got a standard lens hood here, which is labelled Kodak 50mm, and an extension piece. And it is used, if I can find the right lens here for this, that's the road and stock one. Line up my red dot very carefully. Shock the lens into place. So, with this, we take our standard 50mm lens hood. That bayonets into place in the mount. And we have an extension. And the extension is labelled Kodak 35mm. And that simply clips onto the front of this hood to give us a 35mm hood and that's the secret with your 35mm f5.6 you are using your standard 50mm rectangular hood with an extension and it's worth noting that the standard hood you want for a Retina 3C camera will be labelled Kodak 50mm and its extension is labelled Kodak 35mm. Now there are similar hoods for later cameras. They were labelled Kodak 35U50 because it did the 35 and 50 lens on the Retina S-type lenses, the f2.8 S-type lenses. And the extension that you got with that set was for the 80mm lens, was it the 85mm lens, and it was labelled accordingly. The hoods look much like this, they're not the same. Don't get them mixed up. Now, setting the focus correctly with these accessory lenses is a fairly cumbersome business. So, we'll start with, let's, I've got a the older style of 80mm lens here, in this case it's a Snyder one, so I shall find a good camera to demonstrate that on. This 3C will do nicely. Okay, so first we'll fit the lens, carefully lining up my red dot, and there we have it. This particular lens has a single scale on it, and it's point that you'd set it is at the base of the lens. Now there's a point to that and we'll get to that shortly. So if we were going to use this lens on our camera we need to first measure the subject distance and we do that in the normal way. You point your camera at the subject, you'd align your rangefinder images and at that point, if you had the standard lens on the camera, the image would be sharp. We don't have the standard lens on the camera, we have the telephoto lens on the camera, so there's more work to be done. So in this case, I've decided that my subject distance was 12 feet. Now we need to set the focus to suit the telephoto lens. And this is done here. See if I can get you in. At the bottom of the camera, 
we have two focus scales. There's a bright one over here. Now that's for the wide angle lens. There's a dark one over here. That's for the telephoto lens. Now the register mark that you line those up against is a little triangle in case of the wide angle lens and a T. For, to, that's the register point for a telephoto lens. So, having taken our measured distance, which I think we decided was 12 feet, we would rotate our focus scale ring using your normal focus knob here to line up that 12 with the T. And at that point, our 80mm lens is correctly focused at 12 feet. If you looked at the main focus scale here, which is the one for your 50mm lens, it's showing somewhere between 4.5 and 5 feet. So it's quite different. If you were to look through the rangefinder, the images would be anything but a line. They'll be quite far apart. That's okay. That information was for the standard lens. The important thing here is this information on the telephoto scale, and that's correctly set for our telephoto lens. And that's how you'd go about setting the focus for an older 80mm lens like this. There's something else worth noting here is the scale on the lens, as I've already told you, it's not connected to anything internally. But this is your depth of field scale. So if we were to turn that dial, we'd line up our distance, which we said was 12 feet, and line it up with a little triangle mark there. And then we can read off our depth of field. So here you can see that, say, at f11, looking at this scale, I could say that our focus would be adequate somewhere between 10 feet and 15 feet. And uh, if you were using a smaller aperture, of course, your depth of field would be somewhat narrower. And if it's right down at f, if we're using f4, which is the maximum aperture of this lens, the depth of field is quite narrow indeed and probably only extends from say 11 and a half feet out to 13 feet at the very most I would think. And now I'll show you how you would set the focus with one of the later lenses because they made it a little bit more convenient. So here I've got the, an 80mm lens and again this in this case it's the same, it's the, the Schneider Retina Longer Xenon. This is a later one and it has different scale rings. Now, as before, the scale rings are not coupled to anything internally. They're not focus rings. Forget about them being focus rings, they are not. So, back to our example. We decided our subject was at 12 feet. So how do we go about using this? Well, on the bright scale, which is our 80 millimeter scale, bring our 12 up to the register, the little triangle register point there. And if we read directly opposite that point, we will see that that aligns at a mark somewhere between four and a half and five. That tells us we need to move our focus scale here to between four and a half and five. So that's much less cumbersome than having to go down underneath the camera and set it on the auxiliary scale at the bottom of the camera. But it achieves the same thing. And if we were to go down to the base of the camera here, we'll see that we have 12 feet aligned up next to our T mark there. So it achieves the same thing, but it saves us having to turn our camera upside down. So that's a, uh, a minor improvement in terms of usefulness. Again, we have our depth of field scale here, and we can read off our depth of field scale there for our chosen aperture. And so that's our, eight, uh, our 80 mil lens, and basically that's how you'd use it. If, for example, you had the 60 mil close-up lens, which they call the T160, you would use this focus scale instead. And because it's only it's intended for close distances, so we decided we we're right up close. And this goes down to what? 
six feet I can see on this scale. So if we had a subject at six feet, which we were going to shoot with our 80mm lens with its close-up lens on it, we would be using our T160 scale. We'd turn that so that the six came up against the little dot triangle register mark there, and it would tell us that we need to set our main focus scale here to something around 25 feet. And so we'd do that. And then our lens would be correctly focused for use at 6 feet with the close-up lens on this 80mm lens. But I'm not sure any of you will need to do that. Here I have a 35mm lens. This is the Retina Curta Xenon 35mm f4. It's a similar design to that 80mm lens I just showed you. It has the dual scales. There is no scale for a close-up lens because that was never intended to be required. So basically it's the same arrangement. Assuming we had our, we decided our target by using our rangefinder was at 12 feet. We would set that on the bright scale. We would look across there to see where we need to be on the black scale, which is our standard lens scale, and it tells me that I would need to be somewhere between 15 and 25, and probably between that mark there and 25, so it's probably about 20 feet to correctly focus that lens. And this is using our scale at the back here. So I would turn the main focus to that position as best as I can judge it. Now at that point, that 35mm lens will be correctly focused for a subject distance of 12 feet. Even though our camera is saying that the main focus scale is set to around 20 feet. So that's about all you need to know for that. Now our tiny little 35mm lenses, if I can lay my hands on the right one, that's the Schneider. Works in exactly the same way. Is this one marked in feet? Let me have a look. Yes, it is. So, yes, so we had our subject. Let's say we had our subject at 12 feet. And if I read across that scale, I can see it's between 15 and 25. Now, the scales are somewhat smaller, so you've got to have your glasses on when you're doing this. But again, I'd be doing exactly the same thing, moving my main focus ring to match that mark between 15 and 25. And at that stage, my 35mm lens would be correctly focused. So now we come to the fun part. How do you actually go about taking a photo with one of these cameras? All right. So let's say that we wanted to take a photo with an 80mm lens, and I'm just making sure I've got the right 80mm lens to match the camera type here, and it's just Snyder one I want. So I'll fit my lens, carefully lining up my red dot. I've got my 80mm lens. I've got my 80mm lens hood, so we're doing well. We need a finder that'll suit. So I'll use my optical finder. So we'll slide that into the shoe. Well, at least I think I'm going to. Is it? That's a very tight accessory shoe. Right, so I've got my finder. I set that to 80mm to match the lens we're going to use. Our hardware's in place. So now I want to determine my exposure. So looking outside and checking on my meter, I decide that for the film that I've got in here, the appropriate exposure was 125th at, let's say, f8. So I set my shutter speed, I set my aperture, and this is one of the older Retina 3C, so the aperture scales at the base. Now my exposure is set. 
check that my film has been advanced because otherwise we're going to miss the photo. Take my rangefinder, look through the rangefinder, check my subject distance, and it tells me it's 15 feet. Check that I'm looking at the right scale here, not the T160 scale, the other scale. Bring my bright scale around here till the 15 aligns with the triangle mark. That aligns almost perfectly with the 6 foot mark on, my, on the black scale. Swing my black focus ring round to just under the 6 foot mark to match what I've just seen. Compose my picture through the finder and press the shutter. With a bit of luck your subject hasn't run off in the distance while you've been doing all of that. I suppose I should have said you could be considering the depth of field that you were going to get at that point at that stage. Well, what did I say that was? I said that was f11 didn't I? So yes, at our focus point of 15 feet our depth of field extends to somewhere beyond 20 feet and probably somewhere around 13 or 14 feet at the, on the inside edge. And if we were concerned that we needed to adjust the parallax of our finder, of course we would have set that. And with this case it's set to somewhere between 2 and 4 metres, so that 4 metres, that's pretty close to 15 feet, so that's, uh, that was probably close enough in, in, to allow us to frame our picture correctly.